because it didn't just it didn't just show the the history of mosque architecture in the UK, but it also played on the parallels of the Muslim identity in the UK. So it was almost as if the mosques themselves were a manifestation of how the identity of Muslims had evolved and have evolved. Um, and so that was partly the key you know, thing for me of why I wanted to buy the book and um, why I actually wanted to reach out to you in the first place. But I mean, to get straight into it, how has the Muslim culture in Britain evolved over the years? And you know, where did it all start? Yeah. <clears throat> um, I mean, you mean architecturally? Mm, Before we get into that, maybe just yeah, broader. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I suppose um, the way I understand it is that there's two main phases of uh, sort of Muslim settlement in Britain and emergence in Britain. There's before Second World War, and essentially we're talking about partition, and then there's after partition of India. So um, before partition, when when uh, Britain was when India was within the, the the British Empire, and there was a number of other sort of colonies which encompassed Muslim countries, um, there was a particular kind of movement of Muslims from the Muslim world into Britain, and largely that was through um, education or work related work related meaning you know you'd have lawyers or um, uh, a civil servant or someone who'd come to England, and this is all happening in what? what sort this of what would year? all be happening, say, through the uh, uh, early part of the twentieth century. So right. you know, through the sort of um, nineteen twenties, thirties, mm. that kind of period. Um, and y the Muslim community here was at that time, if you like, um, um, uh, sort of more more part of the establishment, if you like, and and uh, sort of people who are coming for education and training. Mm -hmm. um, there was. Also, alongside that, um, a movement of uh, or a, settle, a growing settlement of of uh, of uh, it, what was called lascars. Mm -hmm. So people working on ships uh, who would come and stay in the UK, large, and that was largely in port towns, Cardiff, right, uh, East London, South Shields, and Newcastle. Mm -hmm. um, so those were the areas where the very earliest Muslim settlements were established, and that was largely Yemeni and uh, Somali sailors, and then in the East End it was Bengali. Mm -hmm. Um, so there was that plus people coming and going for for training and working and, and things like that. And those the people who, so so people would come and go. It wouldn't necessarily be that there'd be a settled community, right? Um, and it was really post partition mm -hmm. uh, that you got large scale settled Muslim communities emerging. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. So that's really the two broad areas. Yeah, yeah. Um, and then uh, so you're talking about from let's say the 60s through to the 80s mm -hmm. was largely South Asian migrants. So it's from specific areas of India and Pakistan. Right. Um, and in India it was largely uh, areas, largely Gujarat uh, was the sort of source of many uh, kind of migrants and in, in from Pakistan it was Kashmir area and Punjab right. where most people were coming from. So it wasn't it wasn't that you know people come from all over India or all over Pakistan. It was quite specific I see. migration routes that people were coming through. Mm. Uh, settling largely in industrial towns, working in factories, that kind of stuff. So people were coming for, for labour essentially. Mm -hmm. And um, so up till about the you know eighties, uh, uh, the, the large uh, the Muslim community was largely South Asian. Mm -hmm. It was largely migrant South Asian population, and that has gradually diversified. Well, probably quite rapidly diversified from the eighties onwards, and you started to get Muslims coming in. What you find is that migration came in relation to actually uh, to, to conflicts happening around the world, as it were, to kind of global conflicts and upheavals mm -hmm. had an impact on where people were coming from. Mm -hmm. So in the 80s, um, there was a lot of uh, uh, um, sort of m Lebanese um, and kind of mm -hmm. Middle Eastern mm -hmm. sort of migration. And into the 90s, a lot of Somali, Balkan, North African mm -hmm. uh, migrants. And uh, now... Um, I mean, now I suppose people are coming from all sorts of different places. Now a lot of um, people coming through uh, sort of Iraq and Syria, uh, often coming through other East, other uh, European countries uh, mm. where they may have gone to first, and then coming here. Um, so the you know, migration patterns are, are changing, but they generally follow uh, conflict essentially. That's very interesting. So, um, but generally, it's, yeah. it's only about sort of seventy years since mm. you know we were dealing with one generation essentially, one full generation yeah. lifetime. Yeah. of Muslims in the UK so it's not it's not yeah exactly I mean really uh, in terms of like as, as as a settled established community 
um, I'd say, like you're saying, it is about a sort of 70 year. Wow. I mean, history. that never really sunk in for me, really. No. I mean, before that, it was, um, you know, the population was small. Yeah. I mean, I think in the 1960s, what were the statistics? I haven't got them in front of me now, but I think the, the Muslim population was estimated to be, you know, in the thousands. Right. Wasn't it? it wasn't big. Wow. Uh, and before that, there was really handfuls of communities in places like Cardiff and South Shields and mm. then some other, other, other towns, again, largely grown out of Yemeni and Somali settlers. Yeah. Uh, and East London, so growing settlements in East London as well. Um, but yeah, but what we consider as the Muslim community now really uh, is has originated from from the sixties onwards. Right. Actually, yeah. Interesting. Mm. And then I guess leading on from that question would be mm. the architecture itself, because one thing I did get from your book was the idea that when mosques would be you would because you just talked about the pattern that when mosques mosques would follow conflict sorry not mosques muslim immigration would follow conflict mm. when there would be a conflict you would tend to see a migration pattern from a certain area the other pattern that you seem to talk about is the muslims themselves when they got there they felt fairly marginalized and obviously that pattern then became gave root to where mosques and these community centers because they wouldn't just be mosques as per se they would be essentially just ways to support that minority community so almost cultural cultural sort of cultural hubs so in terms of that you know how has the how has the mosque architecture evolved as integration perhaps has increased mm. over the years mm. yeah it's yeah interesting uh question i mean so I think the early mosques, uh, and I think when we talk about early mosques, we talk about um, 60s onwards, the so post-partition mosques, mm -hmm. um, were being established largely as centres around which the uh, uh, a particular community from a particular place could could um, gather and sort of coalesce. Mm -hmm. um, so it might be very specifically a community not only from... Uh, uh, the Punjab or from Gujarat or, or you know or from Bangladesh but from a particular set of villages or, 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 or you know even one village let's say would be behind the establishment of a particular mosque mm -hmm. so you started to get mosques that were established on quite specific um, cultural or ethnic uh, uh, groupings ethnic lines and that's really because they functioned as these places, like you're saying, where where people could come for support and contact and commu and you know getting in touch with other people mm. and finding out about you know who's doing what and so on. <laughs> but also, um, you know, there's there's a particular anthropologist in in in, uh, um, in Amsterdam who's written quite a bit about this, which is about the way in which mosques uh, have they serve to create community. So it's not only that it's not necessarily that a Muslim community exists already. Mm -hmm. There may be a population in an area that are Muslim and maybe come from the same region but it's really in the making of the mosque that a community is formed so the mosque becomes a vehicle through which community is constructed right. That's very interesting. Um, and then it becomes a vehicle through which that sort of community identity or, or dynamics is, is played out right so it's almost without continues. without that mosque they wouldn't have actually been the, the cohesion between the it almost attracted everyone together and yeah. created that community yeah and certainly a lot of mosques will, will talk about how once the mosque is established then more people move into the area because they want to be near that mosque for example yeah. so the mosque on the one hand is a is a product of um sort of a, a, a nascent community if you like mm. but it's also the generator of community as well um, so it sort of has this has a kind of dynamic function it's not mm. it's not simply the outcome it's also a part of a vehicle of of community formation um, what was the what was your question? I mean, yeah. So th just generally, that that explained quite a bit. But then, how does it then? How does that involve as the Muslims become more integrated? Yeah. Because obviously, yeah. Because right, yeah. yeah, obviously, they at that stage they are minority. They feel marginalised, mm. um, and then they use the mosque. Then creates this area that they can, you know, form this co this cohesive co community. But then, as you say, you know, five, ten years down the line, do mosques change? Um, in terms of the way they function, I mean, we haven't yeah, got onto what yeah, they, you know, because yeah. if they were functioning just as cultural centers before, is it is it true that perhaps they change their function yeah. from just cultural centers to perhaps more, you know, more conservative ways of, yeah, of yeah. you know, a mosque I mean, function? I think some do and some don't. Uh, you know, some some you know maybe don't need to. 
um, or don't feel the need to, but some do really develop or, or I- evolve quite dramatically. So, I mean, a good example is the East London Mosque, for mm. example, which started off as two houses on Commercial Road, uh, moved to f- to the site on Whitechapel uh, Road, sort of on 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 um, where it is now. Yeah, and gradually just developed and expanded, and now it's become like a, a major centre. And with a range of activities and a range of community services and lots of kind of outreach work and it's got a school and you know so it's very, it's very much a a institution mm. um so that's the mosque that has really uh, evolved in terms of the things that it does and it's it's its scope and its scale and things mm. like that um i mean i'd say that uh so that's probably one one uh ex- example um and then you may get mosques like the one that i designed in on Hackney Road, for example, which has always been a very local community, you know, Bangladeshi community uh, mosque, and mm. and and it's it does pretty um, sort of functional things. It, it provides prayer facilities and it provides classes for like uh, um, Quranic and Ar- uh, Islamic classes for children after school, uh, and then it has some women's groups uh, that use it as well. Mm. Um, but that hasn't really changed in its in its kind of lifespan, which is from the I think late eighties or early nineties when it was established on that site. Um, so, for example, you'll get ones which just carry on, you know, in in the way that they're that they've always been doing it. Mm. Now, when there's a generational change, I don't know. Will that is that what causes it? Because what 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 does cause mm. a mosque to evolve? Obviously. You know, one would think that you know, if something is evolving and its function is changing, it's obviously down to the users. Yeah. And if yeah. it's down to the users, then perhaps people are deciding to use mosques in different ways. So that's why yeah. I play on this notion of integration. That perhaps if they're getting more integrated yeah. over yeah. the years, perhaps this, you know, this use of just you know mm. the use of just mm. cultural use mm. or the use of just as a community hub then becomes quite redundant. Yeah, and by integration, do you mean sort of integrated means uh, engagement with wi- wider cu- cultural community or society? Or, or I guess I mean... I mean, when I talk about integration, obviously social integration, I'm, I'm, I'm talking about identity in the, in the mm. sense that when, when one obviously comes to a new country, a place with new values and new, you know, and new everything... Mm. Uh, it's very different these eastern and western values that mm. you know eventually and you know you know evidently we can see that people will start to adopt fuse and kind of hybridize different you know cultural subcultural practices mm. so when i say integration i mean perhaps picking up certain of certain vernacular culture mm. you could say or certain you know local cultures yeah in their uh, activities yes or, or, yeah yes yeah. um so I mean, they kind of start to diversify what exactly, they do. yeah. Um, I mean, I think again, some do. Uh, I mean, as, in as much as, for example, s- I mean, like the East London Mosque has a gym, for example, right? A nursery school. Because um, would you find that sort of thing in a you know typical traditional mm. Eastern mosque? Mm, it's a good question. I mean, probably. I mean, I, I think you'd probably get sort of schools and things like that. Yeah, but I don't. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, maybe. You mean maybe they that they sort of have these sort of facilities which yeah, are yeah because in, in my experience of mosques in the eastern yeah. part of the world yeah you don't usually find yeah. you know these social hubs or mm. any of these community activities to to do you you normally just find the yeah just the, the sort just of worship go and pray and yeah. go back home or yeah I mean it's an interesting point it may be that because they're in this country and because you know it's 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 a minority community as it were. Um, that it has to cater for a number of different things for that particular community. Yeah. So maybe that's why they sort of create these di- more diverse facilities. Uh, what a lot of... Um, th- there is also, I think, a, a more of an understanding uh, in this country, which again, maybe because of the context of being in a, in a new country, of the mosque as a, as a social space. Um, mm. So a lot of... So for example, the MCB have been doing a project over the last year or so on... Um, the prophetic mosque, the, uh, the prophetic mosque model. So, so the idea is that uh, sort of encu- they had a conference last year. The, I think the idea being to encourage mosques to adopt a prophetic model. And what they mean by that is a mosque which has a number of different functions happening within it. It's not just a place of worship, mm-hmm. but it's also a place where you know different social and prophetic. Functions. Referring to referring the way to that the, the, yeah, the prophet, prophet Muhammad yeah, had it. 
Yeah. So they're, they're right. They're, what they're saying is that the Prophet's Mosque was not just a place of worship, but it was a social space as well. Right. So this is the the idea behind it, um, and that therefore you know that that should be a model for mosques to follow. Mm-hmm. So that's that's a, a particular strand of thinking, which maybe, like you're saying, it maybe it's sig- important here because of catering for a wide range. Well, it's very interesting maybe. thinking that you yeah. know it, it it took. I mean, if we have the facts correct, you know, mm. just speaking anecdotally, you know, I I I genuinely have not come across very progressive mosques in mm. the eastern part of the world. Yeah. I mean, we do see obviously the modern take on on how mosques should develop, obviously in the, yeah. in the east as well, but. You know, you do normally find more of the progressive thinking happening in the West, which is interesting. Yeah, yeah. And especially interesting because that is the, as you say, the prophetic tradition. Right, yeah. So it's yeah. almost as if coming to the West has then has, has yeah. actually sparked the, 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 the genuine way of, sure. of, of of what the vision should be yeah. when it comes to mosques. Yeah, I mean, and it could be, again, like uh, uh, the reason being because uh, in, an, in a Muslim country, you have all of those other facilities anyway, so mm. there are other places where you can, you know, go and and socialize or or, or sort of have other types of social interaction mm-hmm. in different places. Um, and you don't need to do it in the mosque. Whereas here, the mosque is really the the main hub for a, a particular, or potentially the main hub for a particular community. Um, you know, although you do start to get other types of spaces where Muslim social. Um, uh, uh, space happens as well um, you know so restaurants or ice cream bars is another sort of thing that is, is quite popular amongst mm. uh, Muslim users as well. so you know there are other types of spaces as well definitely yeah um, but yeah I mean so maybe maybe the mosque needs to do more yeah this idea of needing there needing to be certain spaces for Muslims mm. or you know let's not say Muslims but for Bengalis or mm. for Pakistanis or for Russians or whatever you know whatever the you know ethnicity yeah. is or the demographic yeah. is in this cosmopolitan you know, you know mm. mixing pot that this notion of there needs to be a space for this type of person I mean it's a it's, it seems to be a controversial mm. thing to actually mm. say because mm. It's essentially saying there needs to be a different space for a different type of person. Mm. Now, obviously, taking into consideration where the Muslim culture came from, you know, they were minorities, they were marginalized. They had to start with these grassroots kind of movements. Otherwise, you know, they mm. wouldn't have been able to walk into a pub and, you know, be like, you're right, sure. you're right, mate. You know, they, they would have, it, mm. it wouldn't have worked. So now that we have reached a point where you know, I myself, sort of second generation, third generation, mm. whatever, you know, the next generation of, you know, and, and perhaps yourself, I don't know much about your background, but um, the next generation of Muslims who don't really feel like they need to be in a specific place or a special place mm. to feel that <clears throat> sort of cultural inclusivity. Yeah. Now we see perhaps a... There's a bit of a, you know, I think a bit of a battle going on between these this sort of intergenerational battle between the older and the newer generation yeah. who feel perhaps, you know, I mean, personally, in my experience, and I know this to be true of many others, that obviously our parents were not as integrated. I use this word again, uh, you know, I hope we mm-hmm. kind of know what we mean by that now is we feel much more integrated and of, and feel the need to be integrated more. Yeah. Um with sort of Western values, if you like. Yeah, yeah. And the constant battle, I guess, Mm -hmm. comes from Mm -hmm. the question, can our beliefs and Mm -hmm. can our religion, if you like, uh, can our identity allow for that? Mm. So, um, so for example, uh, can you exist, uh, or can you, let's say, express or, or embody your Muslim identity um, as fully as to whatever degree you want to um, within a, a wider sort of plural culture or, or, or exactly, uh, yeah. without having necessarily needing to have um, distinct cultural spaces is that what you're sort of definitely yeah I mean that's at? yeah perfect yeah. way of summing up <laughs> yeah no it's a good it's a good it's a good point I mean I think um it's interesting because the thing is you do get distinct cultural spaces for all of the different cultural groups that you get in London for example you know everybody has some kind of a space 
which is uh, almost like a secure um, space, which where where they ident they can identify, you know, and there's people like them if you like, and and you know, there's a familiar um, culture and environment and so on and so on, and uh, in a way, that's what makes diverse. I mean, I think that's what kind of makes diverse societies in particularly interesting is that you do get so many of these different types of cultural practice going on. Mm. I think, and this is where th there's a there's a particular um, sort of idea uh, of interculturalism. I don't know if you've come across that that term or that idea. No. Um, so the intercultural idea, as opposed to multicultural, right, is that you have a number of different. You can have a number of different groups or cultures with quite distinct cultural identities. Um, and they can almost live, you know, quite quite distinct, separate, if you like, lives. Um, so if you think about the Orthodox Jewish communities in North London, for example, mm -hmm. um, who who live uh, really quite specific cultural um, lives, um, that that's not so. From in an intercultural model, that's not per se. That's not a problem. The issue is: is there a way of creating contact between? cultures? So you can have a quite distinct cultural uh, uh, sort of world that you may well live in, but the issue is. Uh, is there a way for other people to access that? Mm -hmm. uh, is there a way to kind of communicate or make contact with that across cultures? Um, and I think that's maybe that, I think that's one thing. So maybe there isn't it isn't necessarily a problem that you have these distant mm. cultural spaces as long as there is a way of being able to access cross culturally as well. Mm. Um, and I think, but I think the other point of do you need them? Like, do you need them? Like your generation is 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 interesting. I mean, that's something that I. I, I I do wonder about because I do think that um, so for example my parents came from India so they would have been one of these f early settler, settlers f post partition to 1960s late 50s early 60s they came here and we were let's say the first the first second generation of that mm -hmm. you know of that first wave of the second generation are born here a uh, uh, sort of um, uh, uh, thing and you're probably the next one so I do wonder, I did think, uh, I did used to think that, you know, issues of identity and uh, integration and uh, marginalisation was going to be an issue for us. But I thought, you know, the next generation, it's really not going to be an issue. They're not going to be bothered about it. But actually, your generation is as, if not more, um, concerned with identity, if you like, than I thought would would be the case, which mm -hmm. I find really interesting. Um and I think it's because well I don't know why it is to be honest but but par partly I wonder whether it's because um, identity has become a bigger issue generally anyway now in society mm -hmm. so when I was you know growing when I was kind of your age let's say um, there was it was very clearly that the, you know maj minority majority was very clear um, there was very distinct groupings you know and it was it was much less diverse than it is now in the sense that you were Asian or you were black or mm. or you were kind of white or you know there was very clear boundaries between groups and there was very clear kind of uh, sort of if you like uh, kind of white dominant culture uh, and then marginal cultures mm -hmm. um, but now that's not certainly in cities that's not really the case now where the whole minor minority and majority dynamic has been uh, disrupted because and London is I think you know last census London became one of the first or if not the first probably in Europe uh, ma minority majority city meaning that <laughs> there's no you know there is no single uh, well there may be what, a single m majority but there isn't a uh, the, the minorities are now the majority if yeah. you like um, so that's so I, and then also with lately with the whole issue of kind of Brexit and Trump and so on identity has become an issue for white white uh, people as well uh, because suddenly white white culture has diversified into again like that the, there's become diversity the left and the right in, yeah, yeah left and right and liberals and and you know sort of a, a kind of a, the rise of fascism and so mm. on um so you know before it used to be that identity was only an issue for people from minority backgrounds mm. but now identity is much more recognized as actually everybody uh, it's an issue for everybody. Everybody has to start to really kind of mm. think about who they are and how do you define that and how do you sort of articulate that. So in a way, um, so coming back to your original question of whether you need distinct cultural spaces. I mean, are you trying to get at, are you sort of trying to say that the mosque in a way is a, is the mosque a sort of old fashioned 
idea is that what you're sort of saying or a kind of outdated idea yeah i mean definitely space? definitely yeah. that'd be a question yeah <laughs> like i wanted to ask yeah. yeah i mean it's a really interesting question i mean I, I do wonder uh in a way who is using the mosques in a, in this kind of hugely regular way because actually um not a lot of the people that i know let's say like muslim b background people are regular users of mosques. I mean, mm. maybe once a week or, or, you know, now and then. But in terms of, like, mm. really, really use the mosque on a sort of daily basis, not not, not necessarily the people that I know. Mm. Um, so I do sort of wonder who is the... Who are the kind of congregation, like the daily sort of congregants? And it might be actually quite small. Um, mm. And, you know, so partly I do also wonder whether... I mean, a lot of kids, a lot of children use, you know, a lot of parents take their children to sort of mosque classes and so mm. on. And certainly there are some very well used and active mosques around for sure. Um, but I think some are also used actually quite, probably quite sporadically, or quite a, a sort of low intensity, if you like. Definitely, um, yeah. But are spaces for these kind of congregational events. Definitely. Um, but yeah, I mean, I mean... What, there's an interesting yeah, it's an interesting topic you raised that who who are the users mm. and how frequent are they using it mm. because you know from my experience personally um i was a regular mosque mm. user when i lived in tunbridge wells for example but now that i'm here i'm mm. traveling a lot mm. um so you know generally speaking to have somebody in their youth who sort of is a regular mosque user Maybe one would assume that it wouldn't be the case, but mm. you know, me being one of them, mm. or at least somebody who sort of would be one of them if if the if the circumstances allowed for, then, you know, I I think it's a lot more than you you yeah. think. Yeah. Um, but then it also makes me ask the question that if perhaps there were you know if mosques were perhaps less traditional thinking or mm. you know very. Mm. You know, sort of like historically nostalgic in some ways in the way that they function and yeah. you know even the people and the you know the sentiment that's around mosques which i believe personally that architecture has a huge effect on um then perhaps you'd see more more young people yeah. using them yeah. but the, the the thing which you mentioned earlier i found really interesting because you, you said the whole idea of interculturalism mm. and that there should be there shouldn't be this expectation um that you know, everybody should assimilate. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. That's you know, the idea behind Assimilation it. doesn't yeah. mean integration. Mm -hmm. And that's why I like to use the word integration because I think that word does allow for the idea that, you know, we can respect everyone enough mm. to allow there to be differences. Mm. But we mustn't let those differences, you know, separate us and, and otherize each other, essentially. So, so, yeah, I mean, that's a really interesting mm. topic you raise. And if I could just sort of go back to the idea of architecture as well, in terms of um, what, what role does that play in all of this? Based on all of what we've just said, do you think there is a particular vernacular, a typology for a mosque in yeah. the UK? <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, in a way, uh, yeah, I think I do. And I think this is gradually um, coalescing in my mind, uh, this idea of what is the, what is the sort of english mosque vernacular if you like um <clears throat> i think there's been a uh, the, 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 there's been a sort of an ongoing dynamic which is between the traditional and the modern and the idea that a mosque which replicates traditional forms and traditional uh, uh islamic um symbols is somehow a pastiche uh, and not it's not real architecture because it's a copy of something and it's and often they're talk, talk described as you know um the kind of Disney disnification is one of the words that's often used with these wow. sort of, um kind of mosques which are kind of replicas if you like or attempting to replicate uh, some a building from a Isla period of islamic history and that is of often uh, put a alongside or sort of countered with the idea that a mosque should be a mosque in in, in the west at this point in time should be a contemporary modern building hmm. to reflect uh, a, a modern Muslim identity if you like um, and I've sort of struggled with that idea uh, and in the buildings that I've designed I've I, 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 li I, I like to think I've tried to bridge the two 
But I struggle with the idea because I think that um, if if you sort of reject what has actually been built in this country, so basically if you take the whole kind of history of, if, or if you take the whole body of work of mosques that have been built in this country, and you accept that that is the history of the mosque in, in Britain, so whether you like it or not, um, what people have actually built through their own endeavours and often through their own design. So many of them are self-designed buildings. So they're not necessarily designed by architects. They might be drawn up by architects that people found, you know, mosque committees would find an architect locally, but they'd often say to him, you know, this is what we, usually it was him, this is what we want you to design, to, 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 this is what we want our mosque to look like. So they're largely self-designed buildings, which in one aspect makes them vernacular kind of already in, 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 in the fact that, you know, vernacular architecture is often describes architecture which is done without architects it's kind of people building their own buildings mm. um, and uh, uh, if we take that body of work uh, and saying that, okay this is Muslim architecture in this country then how do you draw from that to create a new architecture rather than looking at modern buildings mm. and rather than looking at a modern language you know, or looking at the language of modernity or of contemporary architecture and saying let's create mosques that incorporate what we see in you know kind of architectural culture you know magazines and so on um in a way that's there's something slightly slightly i have a, a problem with that because what you're doing is you're sort of bypassing what has already happened in the last 60 or 70 years which is what people have actually built mm. so i wonder whether the actual there is actually a there, um, well i think there is actually a Mus muslim vernacular in this country in, in terms of architectural vernacular uh, I think it's disregarded because it's often thought of as being not of architectural merit um, but I think it's actually quite a strong visual language mm -hmm. um, and what I'm interested in is sort of exploring that visual language mm -hmm. um, and then um, using it to sort of create a new architectural uh, um, you know register or new architectural language for the mosque moving forward mm -hmm. so it's it's moving forward it's an architecture which incorporates that whole history of if you like folk or vernacular muslim building mm -hmm. practices and then and then sort of turns it or adapts it or evolves it into something else mm -hmm. so that's the sort of if you like the design uh questions that i'm looking at dealing with at the moment and i'm sort of doing some drawings and so on around just exploring that idea so if if the history mm. or like you say that you know that backlog of of mosque folk mosque that we have is to be used as a template or to be used as a guideline mm. my question is isn't that all of that itself i mean if that if that was supposed to be stuff we draw on mm. to make new sort of evolved yeah. you know versions has are those mosques themselves not already modern takes no. on the traditional mosque so if we're making now a modern take on the modern traditional mosque yeah. are we then just not making anything new are we just building on what's already um, been built I think it depends on how we do it because I think in a way those buildings if we call them vernacular or folk architecture let's say and not, not meant in a der derogatory way but just mm -hmm. as a way of describing it and by that we mean buildings that are that are self-built and self-designed by the communities that use them so they're not professionally designed mm -hmm. let's say um <laughs> which a lot of a lot of the kind of canon of mosque architecture in this country is mm -hmm. uh, i mean there are uh, from the sort of 90s onwards a lot uh, has been built by designers not ne not even not necessarily architects like engineers and, and other designers who have designed mosques as well um but if you say if you took that uh, folk architecture as a as a sort of body of work um, it's not necessarily and this is the thing about the vernacular is that it's not a necessarily a interpretation of the past it's a replication of the past so what they're actually trying to do is is literally replicate mm. the past um, and obviously in translation it gets changed but those changes are not intentional, if you like. Mm. They're not kind of like a, a knowledgeable changes. And that's the whole, that there's a whole sort of uh, you know, discussion around vernacular uh, and, and, and the design that is done knowingly and unknowingly, if you like. I mean, it's kind of a thing mm. within sort of vernacular and folk art uh, sort of discussions, as it like, if you like. Whereas, you know, there's, uh, there's the idea that architects, uh, you know, an architect can't do vernacular architecture because you already know too much. Uh, and again, I don't mean that in a in a in terms of a value based judgment, but it's simply that you've been trained 
and once you've been trained the ability to do anything if you like authentic for one of it is 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 taken out of you because it's only people so the idea of the vernacular is that people who are untrained uh their work is somehow authentic now that's a that could be a problematic way of describing it mm. because um you know it could be that you sort of um you devalue the architect yeah, yeah. and you sort of romanticize uh the untrained yeah. artist if you like uh, which is something that's happened throughout our art history true um you know the idea of naive art and so on and yeah. so on but you know i think there is something in it there is something that people who are let's say untrained there's a kind of an Im- let's say an immediacy uh that 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 what they're trying to do is very um you know com- is, is is reproduce or replicate mm-hmm. um architectural form it's now, very raw and genuine and yeah. it should be respected yeah 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 respected and and yeah and uh respected but also um you can't avoid it is what i'm is what i'm i suppose i'm saying mm. is that if you ignore it uh then there's something you know that it's it's uh it's it's you're not designing you're not doing your job properly if you ignore right. it because actually that is you know the canon of mosque architecture in this country is all of that stuff mm. if you say actually that's not relevant because it's no good and i'm going to look at you know other sort of bits mm. of high architecture to create my mosques mm. then you're actually ignoring what a- is actually there do you know what i mean and, and what yeah. the mosque is in this country mm, mm, mm. So that was the natural root of how these things came about yeah and so yeah. ignoring that is to actually ignore the the very foundation of what yeah. vernacular is in yeah, this country. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah and also what the very foundation of the mosque is and what is th- what the mosque is in this country yeah so how do you sort of incorporate that uh, and then if and, and then evolve and then develop that into an architectural language for the mosque because the question underlying it is what what should be the appropriate architectural language for the mosque in this country mm. if you like and that's the question that's always there that's very that's, yeah that's very interesting i mean i was i wasn't expecting an answer that good to be honest but <laughs> is this i thought you were going to be like no there isn't do what you want <laughs> right no it's cool so now going to things on a slightly broader level mm. We've discussed what the mosque should be in terms of the UK context. What about sacred space in general? Mm. You know, the main question being, what makes a space sacred? Because obviously, you know, with all the case studies you provide in the, in, in, in the British mosque book, and generally speaking in, you know, what we've been discussing, there is the whole nostalgia behind it. There is a whole sort of historic identity behind it, and that does play a part. I think it'd be it'd be wrong to say it doesn't. Uh, in 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 making a space feel like home, and making a space feel comfortable, and making a space feel like it has, like you're able to feel sort of at ease with your worship or with your you know transcendent feeling or whatnot. But if one for example, was to convert, and you know, there are a lot of conversions going on around this time as well. Some famous ones as well, like Pickthall and those type of guys. So for them, they had no real cultural, you know, nostalgia with any of this. Mm. So what made this mosque sacred? I mean, l- let's just ask the question, what makes a space sacred? Mm. Uh, it's a good question. I mean, <clears throat> it, it was, it always, it's always there, that question. The thing is, when I've, Whenever I've talked to people about their mosques and whenever I've designed mosques, no one has ever used the word sacred in, really? in any of my conversations. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so it just doesn't, it's almost like the sake, the idea of sacred um, doesn't seem to exist for. What word comes up? <laughs> well, uh, I mean, it's just, it's much, it's Money. much more sort of, no, yeah. Well, the only, the, the biggest parameters is space. We need as much space as possible. That's true. How many people can we get into this building? You know, we don't want, um, uh, a double height space because then we're losing floor space yeah. for example so you know interiors of these buildings are often quite functional because they would just need to create as much floor space as possible mm. and uh, the idea it also is that um, you know I think people uh, practice their religion quite um, in a quite an embedded way so it's not necessarily that they see their religious practice as being hugely separate from their everyday lives as from f- but but it's it's much more a part and parcel of their kind of everyday lives so there isn't i haven't found that same separation between secular and sacred or or sacred and non-sacred so that translates to 
uh, the way they talk about their buildings or needs for their buildings and things. And I kind of wonder, I haven't really looked at this in much detail, but whether the secular sacred d uh, distinction is more a modern and maybe Western idea. Um, because uh, it just it just hasn't nobody said we want a spiritual space or wow. can you make our space sacred <laughs> you know they just say you know they know that this is we need we need a space to pray yeah that's the direction we need to a place for that's evolution. a really interesting observation um, you know we need to have a place where our shoes are going <laughs> to go it's very functional <laughs> you know um, sorry I, I just find it hilarious because yeah. you know you might be right because you know uh, personally someone who mm. who does feel you know they need feel a need mm. to have a belief in sort of a theological mm. foundation and to have a you know a spiritual sort of uh, belief mm -hmm. i feel that to be quite a very important part of my life mm. so my my interactions with mosque have always been that yeah i yeah, want to yeah. have a be in a space that i feel most connected to god or yeah. most connected to a higher being sure and it may well be that that people who are who are commissioning and using the mosque uh, are also looking uh, or are also um, looking for and getting that sort of spiritual connection but in a way uh, they don't necessarily do it, need to do it through a particular kind of architecture in a funny sort of way I mean there's sort of symbols uh, or there's a visual language which people do want to see uh, which I, which um, uh, defines the space as a mosque and often that visual language is, is things we're familiar with such as you know arches, arabesque decoration, sometimes minarets domes and so on so there is this kind of register of, of mm -hmm. visual of aesthetics that probably does need to be there for people to be able to identify that they're in a <laughs> mosque and they're in a sacred space but not in terms of the way the light might would come in or the the, the experience mm. of the space and it's, n it's never kind of experiential it's more yeah. um, functional if you like and it's very interesting you make that point about you know, I keep saying it that you know that, you know that it's a new thing because mm. you know we walk into churches mm. uh, and you know you instantly have the feeling of awe and the, yeah. the feeling of the, the numinous or whatnot yeah because of perhaps the height perhaps because of the stone perhaps because of the, you know the coolness that you feel but the warmth you also feel because of the the giant you know thermal massing around you and mm. the light obviously those stained glass windows the you know the smells the things that are being you know mm. all those experiential factors yeah I so mean, perhaps that does play a role in you know we've now come to this place and now we're concerned about it because we've seen the beautiful churches and yeah absolutely and, and also um there's, uh, you know, I've, I've sort of often um, come across descriptions of the way in which uh, for, for when for first generation migrants, the priority is about establishing a kind of cultural practice mm. um, in a quite a functional way. Mm. Um, and sometimes, uh, you know, there are descriptions of the way in which religion is is brought uh, brought across from other cultural uh, uh, from other from other places or other cultures and sometimes um, uh, you know one way of understanding it is that in order to transport religion from one place to another or in order to transport a religious culture from a from India let's say or from Pakistan to England uh, you have to package it up and then you have to bring it and then you have to unpack it and so you can't bring the whole cultural history with you because you know there's because you know a cultural history which 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 means um, religion is embedded as part of a whole cultural experience and practice and all sorts of things you know so so let's say in your home country religion is part and parcel of the buildings the social practices you know the way you have wedding parties the way you you know have uh, other kinds of social functions all sorts of rituals are, in, are embedded within it but when you um, when you uh, have to take that to another country, you can't take all of that with you. So you have to pare it right down to what are the functional aspects of this mm. uh, faith. So you take the functional aspects of the faith, let's say the rules and regulations, you take it to the new country <laughs> and then you unpack. Uh, and so what you, what you then um, end up with is basically religion becomes a religion is reintroduced as a set of quite specific rules and regulations and that becomes wow. the religious culture of the new place wow. 
Um, and maybe that translates into the sort of way in which you think about architecture. It's like, well, actually, we need a functional space. We need. Where to does do that come this, from? This Sorry, so you, you think that's just something that's naturally um, come about? I'm trying to think where those sort of ideas, um, where I would have come across these. I mean, it's 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 one particular way of understanding the translation of religion. Because it doesn't just it doesn't it doesn't just draw on 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 the way that you say that you 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 basically pack what you need mm. 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 and what you need is the regulations and the rules and you bring them and then yeah. it doesn't just talk about how mosques are now really minimal and just focused on you know mm. benign function essentially but it's also the, the the way the religion is practiced as well yeah, it's it's exactly. it's highly ritualistic yeah. in this country it's 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 highly i mean at least yeah. the cultural way of practicing religion mm. is is highly ritualistic it doesn't really draw on much depth mm. and mm. you know this idea of going deeper into it mm. and trying to contrive mm. real spiritual meaning mm. is something which you know does cause a lot of mm. you know yeah, battles absolutely. between the old and the new yeah. thinkers yeah i mean it's highly functional so in a way what we have in this country in terms of religious culture is is probably minuscule uh, or probably negligible in terms of the depth of what muslim culture actually is mm. because of that separation and this is the whole idea behind um if you like the kind of rupture the kind of colonial rupture brought about through colonialism and post-colonialism and and the separation mm. of communities or separation of people from their history. Um, so that's what has been enacted on not only on diasporic Muslim communities, but any, you know, if you, if you look at sort of um, descriptions of African uh, uh, diaspora yes. through slavery, for example, is this idea that people were completely undisrupted from their past. Mm -hmm. So, you know, people don't know anything about their about their uh, uh, sort of heritages once they've been disrupted and moved. So in a similar way, uh, in terms of religious culture, I think, you know, actually in any sort of diasporic Muslim or any kind of diasporic environment, you're completely separated from your cultural trajectory. So what you're left with is uh, a very kind of pared down set of rules, basically. Mm. And I think that's, yeah, and I think that causes, um, I mean, I don't know if it causes a problem, but it's, it's, it's a, it's a sort of it's a loss because what you don't get is that diversity that you actually get in in sort of mus, a mus, let's say a, a culture which has a has a continuity you get a huge diversity of thought and Definitely. and you know cultural practice and so on. i mean you say it, it perhaps isn't a problem yeah you know i would argue that it i believe it's personally i feel like it's given way to 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 harmful ways of thinking mm. about religion mm. um because in that highly simplistic and you know, rules and regulatory way of thinking, you know, for the one, for the people who are observing, maybe observing is not the right word, but the ones who are, who are, who are on the end of witnessing Muslim practice, mm. will think of it as, you know, if all these guys are doing is worried about, you know, you know, this rule and that rule, yeah. you know, walking, they have to show her an ankle, they have mm. to put some, you know, a mark on their head and they have to wear a hat and they have to wear, a, have a beard and they have to wear a, a long thobe. It doesn't really, it doesn't really give the right message of what the religion is really about. Mm. And, you know, mm. one could think of it in that way in a very sort yeah. of, that's, that's a very benign way of thinking perhaps, but the more extreme way of thinking of it, of it and perhaps you know whether this could be true or not is the fact that it has given away to almost a fundamentalist attitude mm. Mm. that mm. the religion is about these rules this rule this rule this rule and you know you you see some muslims who do carry that kind of yeah that kind of attitude of no openness yeah. and and you know no room to evolve and no room to to, to think freely in in interpreting their religion in perhaps more productive ways mm actually gives way to a quite sort of damaging mm. damaging uh, sentiment yeah i mean i think you're right i think that, that it, it, it is there is there are problems with that yeah mm. that it does generate those sort of uh, but it's interesting we challenges. can draw those parallels yeah. between the architecture as well sure you can see that highly almost that stern brick wall that yeah. doesn't want to change yeah it's almost it's almost a reflection of the of the character of that fundamental yeah. Yeah. you know outlook yeah. as well as well as the fundamental outlook on the yeah. architecture but what i find I'm quite sort of opt what I'm quite encouraged by is actually the 
your generation is quite in interesting, I think, because, um, and I'm sure that's not just in terms of people from a Muslim background, but I think that's probably people from all kinds of different backgrounds as well, is that you're, you seem to be able to um, incorporate cultural heritage or cultural backgrounds. And I think, I think actually, you know, like you're saying, there are obviously a lot of people who are quite, let's say, rigid or, or kind of reductive. But I think there's probably more people who are able to be more uh, fluid mm -hmm. uh, with their sort of cultural I identities. So I think that is that is kind of happening more as well. So there is there is also, you know, reason for optimism. Of course, yeah. I think that's that's definitely an important point to to make. Generally speaking, I mean, we spoke a lot. We've been speaking a lot about Muslims and Islam, and you know, I wanted to keep keep bringing up the, the the idea of how architecture plays a role in, in all of this and we discussed obviously sacred spaces and what sacred spaces what makes a space sacred kind of going back on back back to that the idea of sacredness itself seems to be well maybe religion itself seems to be kind of unfashionable idea nowadays and I think what we've identified is is perhaps the reason is because it's too focused on sort of rules and regulations and doesn't really have you know an open or free attitude to evolve. If we can think of sacredness, a, a new a think of a new sacredness, what do you think that would look like? And is there room for that in the mosque context? Mm. We mean new sacredness within uh, sort of Muslim context, or, or I mean the reason. The reason I, I would say, I mean, I would say yes because, mm. you know, it, the evidence shows that Muslims are the most frequent users of sacred spaces. Mm. You know, mm. there's no no other religion requires the five time daily use of a of a, of a you know of a place of worship, apart from the Islamic faith. So yes, but you know, drawing on, you know, the idea that spiritual practice is, is actually a growing phenomena nowadays you know but people don't necessarily want to tie themselves down to religion but as per se but the idea of spiritual places or sacred spaces if we were to think about that on a general mm. scale what could a new sacredness look like mm. and you know now that you do mention the, the sort of the groups and the labels can we see multi-faith becoming more popularized um <clears throat> I mean, a new sacred space is kind of interesting. Um, I suppose they might be. They might be. They might be somehow non-religious. Non, so yeah, d denominational non-religious spaces, if you like, um, uh, where people from different communities or cultures can can somehow share. I suppose, mm. and I have often wondered. Uh, um, oh yeah, I mean it has crossed my mind. What sort of a building project would a wide range of people contribute to mm. to fund? So, for example, most mosques are funded um, through, let's say, crowdsourcing. You know, people contribute the money and they raise it amongst the community and build the mosque. Mm. And so you've got a lot of people, you know, living in the most essentially Muslim community. Who feel invested enough to want this building to put to to, to give money towards it? Mm. Um, now I, I sort of think that that I wonder if you how could you replicate that model of people feeling invested enough in an idea to want to contribute towards it? So you know what would be the project that both myself and you know a range of you know a hundred other people of different backgrounds? If you said here's a building project that's going to be built uh, on the, on you know around the corner from you, could you give us a hundred pounds for it? So what would it be <laughs> that everyone on the street would say, yeah, we're going to give £100 for that project because we want it to happen? Something that could benefit the whole community. Yeah, something that could benefit the whole community somehow has, you know, uh, some some kind of uh, positive uh, uh, sort of an impact and, and mm. whatever. But also has, would have a series of values behind it as mm. well, I think. Um, <clears throat> I don't know what it is, but I think it can't be that hard. It's, it's interesting <coughs> you say that because there was, a, I think it was a Ju Julian, Ju I forget, it was, the book's called Transcending Architecture. Mm. Um, and they make the point that transcendent space or sacred space for the secular, the non-religious, if mm. you like, mm. 
are art galleries and museums. Mm, that's right, yeah. And yeah. it's this idea that you go and you observe and you you go and you see things in awe and yeah. you reflect on things that perhaps aren't, mm. uh, you know, things that have a more, they're in a more, how do you say it, in a more numinous dimension. Mm. Yeah, absolutely. Something yeah. which, you know, and it's interesting that art, yeah. museums and these kind of programs uh, act like the temples and the mosques and mm. the churches of the secular. Yeah. And, you know, I personally don't see why you can't, you know, why you can't integrate all of those functions together and produce a spiritual space, if you like, um, that everyone can be part of, mm. you know, mm. even the people who don't want to ascribe to any religious sure. way of thinking because, you know, one thing you can't deny or we can't deny is what the facts are. And the facts are, you know, in a highly modernized world, in a, in a world that's getting even more, you know, everyone's obsessed with their phones and addicted to some sort of thing. And, you know, I, I love Russell Brand and his work. You know, he, he's got a book called Recovery, okay. which is a, basically a guideline, takes those 12 steps and shows how people are addicted to you know the most you know minute things you might not even realize but you might be addicted to a certain thing checking your instagram or or, or, or even sleeping late for example but this whole idea that now the spiritual practices are becoming very popular mm. that actually a lot of people want a want a a place to retreat want a mm. place to kind of mm. to feel connected to themselves or feel connected to each other yeah, and yeah. so you know, perhaps yeah. that new sacredness does take on what you would what you would think are conventional architectural programs like a museum or an art gallery, but mm -hmm. they actually are spiritual places. Mm -hmm. I mean, there was that project with Alain de Botton, wasn't there? Have you come across that S a secular <laughs> church? Or sort of I've something? heard of it. I haven't yeah. actually done much about it. Yeah, so that, I think that's what he was also sort of pursuing that idea: is what mm -hmm. would be a sacred space for for secular um, uh, people. Interesting. What did yeah, he incorporate into that? I can't, I'm not sure to be honest. I didn't really, uh, I don't re really look into it in much. But I think he had some buildings designed by mm. some uh, quite well-known architects. I think there's a Peter Zumter one actually, right, somewhere in England. Um, and there is a project. Uh, I can't remember the name of it now, but there is a project which is also about. It's about sort of creating a community in a in a sort of non non-religious um, way, if mm -hmm. you like, as well. And I think that's. Probably humanists are people leading these sort of lines of thinking, actually. Mm -hmm. um, because you know, humanism is quite interesting because it is it has you know a series of kind of rituals and things that might look like religious practice, but it's not bla based on any kind of uh, uh, di di sort of religion in terms of like a divinity based or, or, or sort of denominational religion. So that might be worth looking at. Actually, Definitely, just as a sort of way yeah, as useful that, resources um, yeah. to to look at. It's it's, it's um. It's interesting because I personally believe that the the Muslim faith, the Islamic faith, could benefit a lot from this kind of outlook mm. in terms of of being open to to you know one of the I, I talked about the new generation. One of the common things that keeps coming up in the new generation of sort of Muslim thinkers uh, is the idea of reintroducing yourself to God, reintroducing you to yourself the concept of God and Islam itself, you know, a religion, a, a scripture, the Quran, which is so often, you know, uh, attacked, used, misused. Um, it's It seems to be a very valuable exercise to reintroduce yourself to what these scriptures actually mean and what these texts actually mean. And perhaps... This is one of the tensions that, that, that a lot of the new generation carry with themselves is we need to now not change, not innovate, you know, in the negative sense, but but interpret and and provide a, a, a more productive understanding and a more productive way of practicing a religion which hasn't really had much of a... An, a, 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 a how would you say a successful hybridizing or if that's even a word mm -hmm. a successful mm -hmm. fusion mm -hmm. with 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 the western way of, of living and thinking and you know what you will find and what people will find is that the religion itself is is something which doesn't really make any cultural 
distinctions and something which is based on very uh, universal values. Mm. You know. Mm. Yeah, I mean, so I mean, certainly something's gonna have to happen. I think, in in in, in some especially in in, in the yeah. <laughs> in the sort of context we're in now. Yeah, 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 yeah. And I think it's your, you know, it must. It's probably is your your generation that's gonna be sort of leading the the the, the kind of the way. Uh, because maybe you know your it's your generation that lives much more kind of plural much more plural lives than I mean it's not to say we didn't I mean you know I'm kind of just about one generation above you speak you. as if your time's over yeah but no <laughs> <Come on. laughs> you know, you know. <laughs> but it, it was a different it was a, it was quite a different context when when I was your age let's say you know my 20s about 10 years ago well no, it was yeah. about 20 years ago in fact yeah um it was quite a different context to what you have now. And, you know, because I've got nephews and nieces who are sort of your age, you know, 20-ish. 20, 20 and it's interesting seeing how they're sort of negotiating their Muslim identities mm. um, to different degrees. Some are adopting, uh, some are really engaging with it, some are engaging with it uh, uh, lesser, some, are, some more. Mm. But um, there is still this sense that you kind of can do that as well. Um, but there is a relationship with that heritage in, in all sorts of different ways. I think, and I think maybe, you know, the, I suppose the hope, if you like, and maybe the natural progression, you know, the natural way of things is that as, as Muslim communities in this country are more established, the, the, what happens is you do start to, again, get a flowering of cultural uh, options and mm. practices. Um, so, you know, just as, as in, in, a, in, in the home country there would have been a range of different ways of of doing things because it had been there for like centuries let's mm. say uh, maybe that just takes time to re re-emerge uh, you know so you start off with a kind of rules based you know reductive mm. thing and then and then gradually things flourish flourish and go off and go in different directions and you know maybe architecture follows that so you know the I kind like, of like the optimism at this point in time <laughs> well I think architecture should be could be in yeah. will be used as a vehicle for yeah. for that flourishment yeah. and depending on how well you know people like you yeah. do it yeah. yeah well and you now so you know well we'll see <laughs> so, <laughs> then uh, you know it, it will set the scene of what, yeah. what the future holds I mean that kind of brings us to the end of mm. the you know I was talking about the art because we could go on for hours I, I can imagine but mm, we have things yeah. to do but on that on that note, you know, you, how do you balance practice, right. academic? Because you, you know, you, you're, like I said, the introduction. How do you balance all of these things? Because now we're speaking at a more architectural level. Mm, mm. I've seen it with a few tutors as well that they're they're, they're running a practice, mm. they're teaching at two or three unis, <laughs> and they have a family. Yeah, and you're doing all this research and writing. Sure. Yeah. I mean. Um, uh, sorry, if I you have a very speak. sorry. I mean, I have to. I, I'd have to have, have obviously a, a, a very um, supportive family, so wife and kids, um, and uh, I do much less practice now. So I don't run a practice anymore as such. I mean, I'm still practicing, but I just use. I do work that I can do myself, and then I sort of have freelance help when I need it. Right. So I don't have the office anymore, just because it's it, it's too much to to do really. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, also, I did want to reduce my practice because I wanted to sort of concentrate in terms of practice to start to concentrate on a few specific things and then see what happens. And then maybe it, it, the practice kind of reemerges in a right. bigger way, depending on how it sort of I can direct it a little bit more. Because it was, you know, when I was running the practice, it was kind of quite a broad general practice mm. with some mosque work and c yeah. cultural and community work going on, which was which was good. Mm. Um, so now I've sort of tried to concentrate more on the s specific community cultural mosque work. Um, and less of the general practice, uh, mm. which is more or less working out. Um, and then, yeah, like you say, I mean, you end up having to, I guess you do kind of work a lot, which is not ideal, you know, it'd be nice to have sort of, you know, uh, uh, to be able to have evenings off and things like that. So you do sort of end up doing uh, quite a lot. Mm. But I think try and make sure you get holidays built in. Kids are good because they make you sort of just stop and do other stuff as well. So, you know, that's quite necessary. Um, and then um, ideally if you don't have to commute a lot that helps so mm. I, 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 I sort of I kind of don't live too far out I live fairly close in in terms of central London so I can cycle everywhere nice um, so that helps I think because you know you don't have to build in two hours in the day to sort of uh, uh, sort of 
which I mean, I know, like you're saying, it's good for you at the moment because you're, while you're studying. But you know, if you have to do it over ten or fifteen year no, I can't. period, you know, it's quite <laughs> sort of a. Yeah. Uh, but you know, that's a privilege, really, to be able to sort of not have to, um, not have to sort of have a long commute. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think yeah, just sort of hope that you're, you know, hope you can just keep going, really. Definitely. And, so yeah. <laughs> and then in terms of your, you, you lead the studio design studio for the second years, right, mm-hmm. at Westminster. This question I've always had in my head, and I know it's not the main topic of today. Uh, I hope we've covered enough on that topic. But in terms of architecture school, I mean, I'm sort of in my first year of masters now. You seem to get well. I seem to experience this whole, this very fictional and fantastical side of architecture school, which almost has a. You almost feel like it's being done because it sells. Mm. Uh, it doesn't just sell in terms of the school looks magnificent in terms of the crazy projects they're proposing, but also in terms of the students themselves are, you know, it attracts a lot of students who are like, oh, yeah, I want to go there because I want to produce stuff that looks that good. Mm. But in terms of what value that really has, you know, I've worked at a practice as well where I heard my boss saying, you know, I don't really like these mm. looking at these CVs where they've got stupid buildings that fly up into space, you know why are we seeing universities like the ones you teach at? Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, why are we seeing projects that have that really fictional outlook on things? Um, and it almost seems it feels like there's a rat race between certain studios across the country that, that mm-hmm. try and produce mm-hmm. the most crazy work. Um, and what, you know, what are your studio principles? Mm. I mean, I think... Uh I think one thing is that at university is so it, at university architecture is not just about the practicality of building buildings, uh, but it's about uh, a way of thinking. So it's like architecture is a kind of critical form of knowledge, if you like. So sure. how do you interrogate things that happen in the world through architecture? And the way to do that is to create uh, narratives, to create sort of like fictional worlds, mm-hmm. because through creating fictional worlds, you can ask questions about things that actually happen in in the world. Mm-hmm. Um, because it's only really through um, architecture being a critical practice that it can event can gradually uh, uh, have have a, a sort of impact change in different ways you know even so when you become a practicing architect yeah a lot of stuff you'll do you know most of the stuff you'll do will follow let's say the status quo mm. uh, which is nothing necessarily wrong with that because you'll try and do that in the best way possible um, but then there may also be opportunities for somebody comes to you and says can you do me you know can you do uh, uh, my sc- I want to build a school and I want my school to look like this but you need to be able to say, actually, that's not the, the actually, why not think about it in this different way? And this is going to make a difference to the way in which your school mm-hmm. works. And th- if you do something like this, it's going to have a different impact on the way children learn. Mm-hmm. Or it's going to have a, you're going to have a whole different set of relationships between people. And so in architecture, you have to be able to fuse those quite different types of knowledge and bring them into a, an architectural proposal. Mm. Um, and in a way, you need to be able to say to people who come to you with certain ideas, uh, that idea is actually is good up to a point, but there are other ways that you might be able to do that. And then, and then, and in that way, you can affect sort of change and make kind of better places. And also, you can, uh, you know, in a way, that's the way in which so people don't come to architects to to implement what they want. They come to architects with an idea, and it's up to the architect to say, "Let me take your idea and let me try, let me sort of think about it and turn it into something, turn it into a sort of proposal." Mm-hmm. So it's so that's why I think in university you have to really let yourself be quite, you know, be quite broad with how you really sort of think about projects because you're not going to get that chance again. Right. And it's really a training. It's a training in thinking actually. Um, and then in terms of the making. Like these kind of fantastical drawings, um, really, that's about craft, I think. And I have often thought as well. You know, I'm looking at all these amazing, like fan- fantastic drawings, but I don't I've got no idea what I'm looking at. You know, it, is there is there a point to it? Uh, but I think the point is in the actual making of that object, because um, you know, architecture. You know, you have to be a good craftsperson, mm-hmm. and the drawing is an output of your craft. And if you can make an amazing drawing that is simply incredibly crafted. Mm-hmm. In itself, that is a worthy output. Um, you know, if you can build that into a narrative and part of a sort of critical uh, reflection, observation, you know, critical uh, sort of um, piece of work as well, then of course that's also important. That that is important, mm-hmm. and that's going to have a bearing on how your work is judged. 
um, but uh, for example, you know, highly uh, a sort of highly a, a very well thought through or critical project which doesn't have the craft element to it will fall down because of the lack of craft. Something that's very well crafted but doesn't have the narrative element to mm. it will fall down because of the lack of the narrative. It's really about doing the two things uh, together. Uh, and I think in our studio, because it's a, it's a second year studio, so they're early on in their architectural careers, mm -hmm. um, it's really about introducing the fact that there are big issues that you can start to deal with. Um, so, you know, not expecting uh, students to really get into things in a hugely detailed way or to have, you know, big insights, but to start to engage with bigger issues around the social, if you mm -hmm. like. Um, and also to start to make work which uh, is really kind of well crafted and starts to, to sort of reach those sort of levels of production which, which they should really be aspiring for. So I think, you know, looking at images from universities uh, or looking at drawings that come out of universities and thinking, I want to make work like that, mm -hmm. is actually per a perfectly good way of guiding your architecture education, you know, because you should want to make work like that. You know, you should you should see an amazing model mm. and think, I want to do that because that's what's going to drive you to make good work at the amazing. end of the day. You know what I mean? Awesome. I just want to finish off mm. with just one there's there's a there's one question mm -hmm. from a follower mm. who wants to ask a question and we can just end on that. And so the question is to you <laughs> While your architecture tries to fuse Islam and the West, I'd argue Islam as a belief system has no... I believe Islam as a belief system has no cultural connotation, only Muslims do. In fact, Islam would incline towards the culture of the land in order, to, in order for there to be no impediment to the meaningful message of Islam being conveyed. So how, how about designing mosques wholly in the style of the dominant and host culture of the land and even more so aim it towards Muslims with British culture and identity as well as British non-Muslims? Mm, interesting. So that's what, what that person is saying is in a way, in a way, why draw from cult historic cultural references? Is that how you understand that? So why, why not actually say, let's draw a line under it and let's build for designed for here and now yeah is that is that how you i think so yeah, yeah. No, it's good. But based on the fact that that's what islam muslim yeah is, is about at its core yeah it's about it's about kind of accepting um, the, the the context yeah. accepting the land and becoming part of it yeah 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 i mean i think it's it's a good uh point i think um i think personally i think you can't so i suppose my own view on it is that you can't escape the past yeah, and you like can't you escape where you've come from you just can't, can't escape who you are so um, to me it would feel a little bit like you're disavowing something about yourself mm -hmm. you know personally or culturally to do that but also I think what's interesting is actually trying to incorporate a cultural trajectory and then move forward with it so I think that's my kind of personal view on that but I think you know that that's a perfectly valid position to take actually and you mm -hmm. know many you know modern the modern movement came out of this 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 the modern movement was the similar sentiment you know let's draw a line and let's start from for a new world mm -hmm. so you know what that person is, is talking about is actually quite a valid sort of architectural you know uh, 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 viewpoint um, so but you know personally my own interest is in is in actually the idea of this continuity or the idea of you know how do you actually bringing the richness of yeah, the culture and the yeah the richness and, and the story is quite the important. story and sort of like the fact of it if you like mm. um so yeah it's good, good point amazing thank Great. you thank all right you very thanks much. very much yeah. i hope that wasn't too long that was very interesting i enjoyed that yeah, yeah. thanks thanks for coming good. and it's nice to finally yeah nice to finally sit down and talk to you